A webinar um, jointly organized by the Islamic Renaissance Front and the academic, the academic Staff Association of the International Islamic University, Malaysia. My name is Nagib Gunjaria, and I am a senior research fellow at the Islamic Renaissance Front. Our webinar today is uh, Do Our Universities Need Revamp? Yeah, first. Uh, about the topic. Mm -hmm. Intellectuals from both the humanities and the sciences have been lamenting the slow death of our universities. They conjure up the image of an institution convulsing in the throes of death, gasping desperately for much needed oxygen. These enlightened scholars claim that instead of rigorously pursuing truth and excellence, many academics nowadays conveniently settle for half-truth and mediocrity, an affront to the purpose of a university education. Academia today, the scholars concede, have bowed down enthusiastically to the god of unfettered capitalism. Sadly, our universities have been reduced to a production line that continuously churn out uncritical yet obedient workers to meet the needs of our ever-growing economy. Gone are the days when the main aim of a university was to benefit society at large. In the Malaysian context, for decades, senior academics have expressed alarm at the declining standards of our institutions of higher learning. Ironically, this has been accompanied by an aggressive campaign to promote Malaysia as an international education hub served by homegrown public and private universities besides world-class foreign campuses. Some of these academics argue that our higher education system is engulfed in a deepening crisis thanks to the wholesale adoption of corporate values that put a premium on output measured via a system of key performance indicators or KPIs, a benchmark that captures an individual's contribution to the bottom line. This results in a destructive culture characterized by selfishness, cutthroat competition, and backstabbing instead of a constructive culture of sharing, collaboration, and mentoring, essential elements to re revitalize and pass on the legacy of aging academics. Other scholars decry the politicization of the academia, whereby faculty appointments and succession are based on unconditional obedience and unwavering loyalty rather than academic merit and intellectual scholarship. The consequence is tragic. It perpetuates a culture of mediocrity and injustice where incompetent academics ultimately become future leaders. Last, but certainly not least, others find the prioritizing of quantity over quality deplorable with universities often producing unemployable graduates who lack basic critical thinking and communication skills. Not surprisingly, the latter will often join a growing army of unemployed graduates. By creating a fake demand for a university degree that many do not actually need, these scholars contend that the government is in effect creating a generation saddled with a mountain of student debt that they might never be able to repay. Burdened with so many problems, are our universities still redeemable? So 
an idea about today's program. Yes, so um, first we are going to have a presentation by uh, Dr. Bakri Musa, yeah, and followed by Dr. Sharifa Munira Alatas, and finally by Professor Zaharom, Dr. Zaharom Naim. And after that, we are going to have our discussion, yeah, uh, and with the concluding remarks. So each speaker will be given uh, about 20 minutes uh, for their presentation. And um, after the talk, yeah, so our audience uh, is invited to type in their, any questions they might have in, in the chat, in the question and answer uh, section yeah, of this Zoom program. So um, I'll brief about the profile of our first speaker, Dr. Bakri Musa. He is a Malaysian born and Canada trained surgeon in private practice in Silicon Valley, California. He has given presentations on Malaysian affairs at Stanford University, Stanford University Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the University of Buffalo, and Rochester Institute of Technology. Apart from scientific articles in scholarly journals, his commentaries have appeared in mainstream Malaysian newspapers, the New Straits Times, and the Sun Daily. He was a longtime columnist for the online Malaysia Kini uh, and a regular contributor to the Malaysian Insider. Beyond Malaysia, his op-ed pieces have appeared in the New York Times, International Herald Tribune, and the Far Eastern Economic Review. His commentary was also aired on National Public Radio's Marketplace. Among his publications are The Malay Dilemma Revisited, Race, Race Dynamics in Modern Malaysia, Malaysia in the Era of Globalization, An Education System Worthy of Malaysia, Seeing Malaysia My Way, With Love from Malaysia, Moving Malaysia Forward, Liberating the Malay Mind, and his latest book, The Plundering of Malaysia, Najib Razak and the YM. 1MDB debacle. Um, Dr. Bakri Musa also maintains a blog at bakrimusa.com. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Bakri Musa for his presentation. Thank you, Najib. And I'm looking forward to hearing the views of our fellow panelists, uh, Dr. Sharifa and Zaharum, uh, Professor Zaharum. If I can get the share screen with my PowerPoint, that will help. Uh, let's see. Good. The simple answer to the question at hand is very is straightforward. Yes, you certainly need to revamp our universities. The more deliberate query would be how and why. More consequential is what if the status quo were to continue. In your preamble, you mentioned that academia had bowed down enthusiastically to the god of unfettered capitalism. Let me clarify a few terms, three terms. One's the difference between big business versus capitalism. Two, to clarify private versus public. And three, to discern the difference between cause and effect. In the United States, it is big business that's imposing its pernicious influence, not just on universities, but all other institutions, in particular political. In Malaysia, it is not big business, but big intrusive controlling government. The concept of private and public is slightly different in US versus Malaysia. We all know public universities in US and Malaysia, but the private universities in America, for the most part, or at least the good ones, are not proprietary, in other words, not profit making. They're private, they get government support. For instance, Stanford gets more public funding than UCLA and they don't pay any taxes. Private universities in Malaysia are for profit. They share dividends, they have shareholders, and many of the so-called private universities in Malaysia are government link, owned by government-linked companies like Petronas and Tanaga, though 
there the question of what private means is questionable. There are four private universities like the Malaysian variety in America. One of them is University of Phoenix. The other is DeVry, but they're not among the top ranked. In contrast, private universities in Malaysia are highly regarded. The third concept I want to clarify is the cost versus effect. Infection causes fever, but fever is the effect or the result of or a sign of infection. You treat the infection, the fever goes away, but you just treat the fever, you may feel comfortable, but infection keeps roaring. Likewise, the, hit, the screaming headlines of unemployed and unemployed graduates, obsession with ranking, unable to attract good students, cannot retain talent, talented faculty, and the plethora of junk publications, those are the, those are the results, not the cause of non-performing universities. If you enhance the universities, those parameters would improve automatically. The reform of universities can be put on two, two structures. One is the mission. What is the mission of the university? And the second, the structure that would enhance your execution as mission. The first university in Malaya, the University of Malaya, is not so much a university of Malaya, rather a, a, a desperate attempt to replicate a jungle version of Oxford and Cambridge. It was insulated and not responsive to local needs. The leaders of the universities confused scarcity and difficulty with quality and class. That is not unique only to University of Malaya. University of Malaya, like the rest of the country, was caught flat-footed by the tra tragic 1969 riot because they don't focus on the issues facing the nation. It is important to know your community and to serve the needs of that community. Christensen studied two universities in America that, that at the extreme end of the academic scale. One is Harvard, the top end, and one is by B Bingham Young University, Idaho, none of you have heard of. One is rich, except less than 5% of the applicants. The other accepts every applicant. And even if you're not qualified, the university will make sure that you will qualify for admission. So there are both universities at extreme end, but because they serve the needs of their community, they are successful. Harvard's community is global. PYU's community is local. Then the structure that if the university is a three-legged stool, first is the students. You get good students, well-prepared students, you get good undergraduates. When you have good undergraduates, you get produce good graduates. As for the faculty in Malaysia, is well acknowledged, underpaid, underappreciated, and lack of autonomy. As for the management, it is big, controlling, and inclusive government. The preparation of quality students depends on high standards. Foundation, matriculacy, STPM, and all those thousands of courses to get to university must have uniform standards comparable to global qualifications like the IV and the GCEA level. Most of these classes and foundation matriculacy, at least the government one, starts in January after SP, do not, do not start in January, sorry, that's an error there. It starts in July after SPM. So you have a seven month long hiatus for the students where a lot of education and bad study habits uh, uh, creep in. Another thing, SPM is today considered the terminal examination for schools in Malaysia, for students in Malaysia. But according to PISA, the, uh, whatever, the organization that, that examines students, SPM is two years behind those of OECD countries. A friend of mine who has spent many years in Singapore recently moved to Malaysia and the grandson attended local schools and they found that what they were studying in form four is form two in Singapore. So that uh, agrees with the PISA uh, findings. And second way to prepare quality students for universities is that you must improve your math skills and the second language. In Malaysia, is the English skills. 
Let me digest a little bit because I have some time on the mathematics skills. There is a very interesting study recently on British students who took mathematics at form six at A level versus those students who do not take, form, uh, take mathematics. It is interesting in that study after controlling for groups that those people who took mathematics at form six will have other indicators of superior performance, not just at university, but also in life uh, in terms of, uh, of earning incomes and uh, position in society. So it's important that our students have improved mathematics skills and second language skills, including English. If I have my way, we should teach both mathematics and, and English at all levels right up to form six. As for the faculty, one thing is obvious. The market for academics is global. You can't afford to get good academics if you pay local rates. In one of my books, I suggested international track appointments where you pay globally competitive salaries for those fields where we need talent. We don't need that in Malay studies because we have a glut of that. We don't need that in Islamic studies because we have a glut of graduates uh, uh, of candidates to select. But in those fields where Malaysia has difficulty getting uh, candidates, we should pay global pay. Another way to encourage faculty to remain on staff, and this is common in American universities, is to allow them to have to give them special market allowances for those specialties in demand. They appoint them as consultants to GLCs or allow them to earn private money. A professor of English, for example, can earn money to be an editorial advisor to Straight Times, the New Straight Times, for example. Those people need it badly. You cannot depend on altruism or patriotism alone. I salute people like Dr. Sharifa and Professor Zarum and, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Farouk, who stays in academia. Uh, my hat, I salute you all for doing that. And so should the country. But going back to my paying global tech appointments to attract talents all over the world, Consider this, if you get a foreign professor at 250,000 ringgit a year, that would be a competitive salary uh, globally. His living expenses in Malaysia and the taxes he's paid, the car that he'll buy, he would spend 200,000 ringgit of that. At the end of the year, he would be lucky to save 50,000 ringgit to, to repatriate to home country. So his actual loss of foreign exchange is only 50,000 ringgit. You compare that to sending one student to the United States at a cost of 250,000 a year, all that 250,000 ghosts leaves the country. So in terms of loss of foreign exchange, it is cheaper to have a foreign professor come to Malaysia than to send a student abroad. If you hire five American professors, that's the equivalent of spending one student to sending to America. Think of the number of students who would benefit if you have five talented foreign professors. It will change the culture of the university. On top of that, think of the local multiplier, multiplier spending effect of 200,000 per professor or five professors a million a year compared to zero uh, multiplier effect if you send students abroad. I have a proviso for that, however. If those students are accepted to top universities like Sharifa in Colombia, then by all means, we should do that because those are our precious seeds of the future. So that is worthwhile to spend. What do I mean by top universities? In the United States, there are about 100 to 150 of those top universities. In UK, Australia, and Canada, I would say no more than half a dozen or so. And when sending students abroad, you have to be very cautious because University of Pennsylvania is an Ivy League institution, but Indiana University of Pennsylvania accept, accepts every student who applied. As for the management, the third leg of the, of the structure of the university, instead of the government controlling the ministers going to see the campus every few months or few weeks, the government should use the major levers of funding, appointment of senior personnel, and to the governing boards. I remember my years in, at McGill in the 1960s, when there were very few French Canadians on McGill universities. The, the French provincial government did not force McGill to employ French Canadians. Instead, they used the funding mechanism where if the more French Canadian professors you employ, 
the more French Canadian students you admit, we will give you extra funding. As a result, McGill does the searching itself, McGill does the training itself, and today the issue of French Canadian and McGill doesn't, it, it, nobody talks about it anymore, it's except doesn't arise. The other important thing is that you must have long-term appointment of the vice chancellor. It should be a terminal appointment. You die, you retire, or you get fired. That's it. There's two or three years of warming the sea for the vice chancellor, and then you get your time three, and then you go to the local mosque to retire for Rate, it should end. You must spend your time. That is your last appointment. Unfortunately, a lot of Malaysians, in particular Malay academics, are in a hot pursuit of this top academic, uh, top administrative position. I remember in Malaysia in 1970s, a lot of my colleagues were busy lobbying to be dean, department heads, and vice chancellors. One day I met the one guy who was blatantly lobbying for vice chancellor, and I told him, yes, you want to be vice chancellor. Imagine I'm the minister of education, and I've appointed the vice chancellor. What changes would you bring to the university? He was dumbfounded. He couldn't think what he wanted. All he wanted was a title, vice chancellor, just like Han Nadim, who wants the, uh, uh, the, the Hikayat now stories. All he wants is a dream bride, dream position. Once he got the dream bride, doesn't know what to do with it. So he lasted for two years. Today, I would be very difficult to find his legacy at that university. And if you do that, then you don't need Ministry of Higher Education. Think of the money you save. Think of the money you save not having a minister's pay, not having KSU 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and all the supporting staff. And grant universities greater autonomy. California has many more school, many more universities and college. It does not have a Minister of Higher Education or Ministry of Higher Education. To be great, universities must serve their communities. And I told you about the earlier example of Harvard and BYU, Idaho. Malaysian universities are no exception. It must serve the needs of the community it serves. There are many in my Throughout my memory, I can think of only three example, exceptional examples that originated from campus. One was Tabung Haji that started by Uncle Aziz in 1969. We've mobilized May savings effective, effectively. And the other is Class Asasi that was started in 1970 after the race riot. Now, I gave the credit of, to University of Malaya for Asasi class, I had a talk with the man who, uh, with the, Tan Sri, the late Tan Sri Majid once, and he said he had to twist the neck of the people at UM to start the Asasi class. So it's not really correct to say that's a university initiative, but anyway, it, it is. The third example will be the response to Nipah virus. Our virologists at the University of Malaya recognize this new disease, even though they do not have the expert, they may not have the instrument, model instrument, to do that, they were able to find help. I remember the story of the leading scientist there who packed up the vial of the Nipah virus to bring to Atlanta for the CDC for identification. And he was scared stiff that on the plane at the immigration, the, the people said, what's this vial for? But luckily he got through and got to CDC. And, and, and today the knowledge for Nipah virus is not only applicable to Malaysia, but globally to India. So that's why by serving the local community needs, your results can have global applications. There are many unmet challenges in the Malaysian community. And I just go, you're all familiar, you're there, you're aware of it. One is the deepening polarization in the Malaysian society. Polarized societies is very dangerous to any society, more so societies that are plural like Malaysia. The second issue is socioeconomic disparity that uh, is race, class, and geography. And the third, corruption, plundering of GLCs and visas of power. You all know that, you live through it. But the fourth one is a bit uh, cautious for me, and that is the rise of Islamism. By Islamism, I meant people who use our great faith to further the secular political ends. The late Nicholas Majid of Indonesia used to say, 
Islam, yes. Islamic party, no. And I would say the same thing for Islamism, no. The next levels are low level science and technology and in English houses among our students and society generally. And the key, the key uh, mission for Malaysian universities, universities and education establishment is to make Malaysians, in particular the students, bilingual. And to me, the best bilingual language be Malay and English. And lastly, the importance of addressing the laggardness of the majority of the Bumiputra. I'm sorry to, to end up on a very pessimistic note or negative note, but as a surgeon, I have on more than a few occasions delivered bad news to my patients. But when I do that, I always give them hope and a path towards remedying. And I hope I've done that with my presentation this evening. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Bakri Musa, for this uh, enlightening presentation. So um, for those who just joined us, I would like to um, remind you that the topic for today's webinar is, do our universities need revamped? And uh, today's webinar is jointly organized by the Islamic Renaissance Front and the Academic Staff Association of the International Islamic University, Malaysia, IIUM. So, so now I would like to invite our second speaker for today, Dr. Um, Sharifa Munira Alata. But before that, yeah, just a brief, uh, yeah, about uh, her profile. So Dr. Sharifa Munira Alatas is a senior lecturer and assistant professor in strategic studies and international relations program at the National University of Malaysia or UKM. She earned her bachelor's degree at the University of Oregon and her master's and doctorate from Columbia University. Her specialities are in geopolitics, strategic thought, and foreign policy. Dr. Alatas is also on the executive committee of the Academic Movement of Malaysia, Jirak, and a columnist at Free Malaysia Today, Malaysia Kini, and the Islamabad Policy Research Institute. Recurring themes in her academic and popular writings are West centrism, intellectual imperialism, hegemony, and post colonialism. Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Sharifa Munira Alatas for her presentation. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Najib. And uh, I'd like to thank IRF, uh, Farouk Musa, as well as uh, the academic. Association, Staff Association of um, UIA for this webinar. Um, you know, Bakri, you ended on a pessimistic note, but to me, the entire webinar and the entire um, theme of this webinar is pessimistic. And uh, having said that, I will say that my uh, presentation here is not, not meant to offer any solutions. Um, I I have no solutions to offer, um, but uh, towards the end of my presentation, I will suggest what we as individuals may do um, and stay tuned for that, all right? Uh, but meanwhile, when I say I have no solutions, I, I myself am, am, am part of this um, system, this uh, academia, which to my opinion will never change. It will not change at least during my lifetime and maybe the lifetime of the next generation. Um, and it will only change unless there is political will. Uh, this is the reality. I speak out about the higher education crisis because the system has become very exploitative. And it is controlled by the upper echelon of elites in our society. Who are these elites? Well, they are the politicians and they are big corporate or big businesses. Now, Bakri mentioned something earlier about the difference between big business and capitalism. Uh, yes, there is a difference, but the two are definitely intertwined. Um, the only solution I offer is that 
concerned academic activists like all of us here are presenting um, and others continue to expose these challenges and find parallel, uh, well, parallel ways uh, to educate outside the confines of the institution that we call the modern university. Okay, now take note, I said parallel ways. So I don't mean abandon our jobs at the university, but we have to do double the, the work. Now let me uh, get into the meat and um, uh, rice rather than meat and potatoes of this, uh, my presentation. First of all, I'd like to uh, focus on what the responsibility of, uh, of the university is. What is the purpose of the university? The responsibility of the university is to help students connect with developments in society. Developments meaning um, the successes in society, but as well as the problems. It is not to help students get a job. And this is the misconception that run, is running around societies that we go to university because we are gonna get help so that we can get a job when we graduate. No, let me, let me clarify this. The university should not be controlled by the agendas of politicians. They should not be controlled by the intended career of the student. Or equally, universities should not be controlled by the market economy. Universities, to the contrary, are supposed to be spaces of balance, objectivity, and epistemic justice. Now, what do I mean by epistemic justice? I mean, universities are supposed to give equal treatment, equal weightage to many forms of knowledge. For example, lecturers and students who indulge in deep reflection from all angles. Another example would be to evaluate what modernity means, to reflect on what pre-modernity was like, to evaluate the role of the human in history, the impact of inventions and discoveries on humanity, what caused civilizations to collapse, the causes of war, what led to peace. Now, these are the issues that universities are supposed to enlighten students about give them the broader picture about humanity's role in this thing we call the universe. Today, on the other hand, our universities have become spaces of deep anxiety, transformed to push, rush, compete, stress students and lecturers. Universities, in universities in Malaysia at least, and from what I read around the world as well, Universities in universities are no longer spaces um, of learning that are intellectually inspiring, neither is it fun. Um, this idea of the rat race that used to be a term used in the corporate world is now very much a part of the university ethos. So, um, basically, let me, let me summarize what I've just said. Um, these last few minutes, um, the university is not supposed to protect students from bad ideas, or it's not supposed to protect them from provocative arguments. Universities are meant to be places of neutrality, of debate, of being exposed to provocative and bad ideas. One goes to the university to seek knowledge, not to be ideologically safe. Therefore, um, universities are not spaces of indoctrination. They are meant to groom, to groom everyone, not just the students who are there, but the lecturers as well. They are meant to groom, to deal with adversity and diversity. Uh, it's good for me to mention this uh, quote by the very first woman uh, president uh, of Harvard University. Uh, Drew Gilpin Faust. She mentioned, I think she said this about three, three years ago. 
Um, I quote from her, she said, the key part of any success in life is the part of you that is willing to fail. Now, uh, keep that in mind when we um, enter the Q&A session, because uh, I think this notion of willing to fail will come up. Now, the next part of what I want to say um, um, is about academic, this notion of academic capitalism and how it has destroyed high, higher education around the world, including Malaysia. We have re-engineered our universities into neoliberal entities, shifting our focus from teaching and learning to marketing and academic capitalism. We have ignored the purpose of education, which is to nourish the heart, mind, and soul. So what do I mean by academic capitalism? Academic capitalism is when politicians, university administrators, and the corporate sector self um, sell ed education to the, mat uh, to the masses, all right? This notion of selling education to achieve only one goal, which is profit and wealth. There is less concern with quality teaching, intellectual activities, uh, I, I, if somebody asked me what is the academic culture of um, University A in, in Kelantan or Kedah, I wouldn't be able to answer because um, what are the intellectual activities that go on in the corridors of campus? Um, there's less concern about academic freedom, meritocracy, opportunities for the poor or ethnic and gender balance. And why is there less focus on this? Mainly because these are less profiting, profit inducing. It's not profit, uh, it doesn't bring in any profit to any individual. The MOHE, okay, the Ministry of Higher Education in Malaysia, their stated objective is that for universities to be more efficient, they must open up to the free market economy. The myth is that higher education would be more relevant, more attractive, and offer more hope for the youth. This is their market strategy, okay? This is their marketing strategy. For example, it is rare to see universities advertising uh, in their, um, you know, to attract students. It is rare to see in their advertisements that their greatness, why their university is great, is due to legendary scholars who taught there, or great books that were written there while they were employed at those universities, or that world-renowned uh, discoveries and inventions took place at that university. Advertising today is mostly about fees, facilities like housing. Um, in the US, they advertise about this great climbing rock now, or maybe every dorm will have a, a, a swimming pool, or maybe every room in a dorm may have your own portable swimming pool. Now this is, I, I think um, there is a, a film that was done, a documentary, a collaboration between Columbia University and CNN. Uh, it's called The Ivory Tower. Uh, it explains all of this uh, about advertising and um, the marketing of, of higher education. Um, <clears throat> so that this brings me to the next point that higher education today is embroiled in the logic of economics. The university has become an assembly line for market friendly, profitable consumer products. Who are these consumer products? These are the students. Graduates have become human resource for the corporate sector, for them to use so the industry can maximize profits. Our government, <clears throat> our government is also involved in business, as we know, via the GLCs and the GLICs, what have you. So it is in their interest too, it's in the interest of the governments um, to be in sync with this corporate mentality. And this mentality has resulted in the exaggerated focus on specialization. A student now takes courses that are neither here nor there. 
For example, in engineering, uh, you will in engineering department, you will have engineering philosophy, or you would have the history of technology, or the morality of physics. Uh, students are less exposed to the fundamentals of logic and ethics, which is actually part of the wider discipline of philosophy, the fundamentals of philosophy, which is the traditional humanities subject. Or another subject would be global civilization, which is part of the fundamentals of history. Universities today misunderstand what it means to be holistic and to attain a sustainable education. To them, these are contingent only upon job seeking and what the economy demands. So uh, since they misunderstand holistic, uh, I will elaborate further on how they continue to misunderstand what it means to be multidisciplinary or to internationalize university uh, education or higher education. Academic conferences, let's take that for an, uh, an example. Academic conferences <clears throat> are now sexy combinations, okay, or roja of the sciences, the arts, the humanities, the social sciences, uh, te technology, you know, it's all grouped together in one conference session or one conference uh, day or two. Papers presented, are less academically rigorous, ideas are watered down to accommodate a hybrid of disciplines. Now, I, I, I'm generalizing, but it is more the rule than the exception because the exceptions do exist, all right? There are still many academic um, associations around the world who stick to their traditional role of um, rigorous academic debate and uh, announcing new findings. Um, so what does all this mean? In other words, we are now, um, we now have a very superficial conference culture that avoids deep um, critical debates in the social sciences specifically, uh, because that is my background, concept building, theoretical critiques, exposing new knowledge, facts, interpretations, is a thing of the past. What we have today is um, what I call a jack of all trades and master of none, of none syndrome. Uh, this is pervasive um, in Malaysia, more so uh, than in other parts of the world, but it's, it exists elsewhere as well. Um, the intellectual eclecticism is of the centuries uh, gone by is a thing of the past. All right, we young scholars today attend conferences hoping to beef up their uh, KPIs, you know, their key performance uh, indicators. That's about it. They attend these conferences, scramble for funding to attend these conferences, get promoted, move up the academic hierarchy. Um, and, you know, it is no surprise, what, and we shouldn't be wondering why we have many. Professor Kang Kong walking uh, the streets of Malaysia. Um, in terms of research, it has been assaulted by the impact agenda. What is this impact agenda? It is now considered useful only if it has wider social and economic usefulness. Research is useful only if it benefits the powerful elite. And in Malaysia's case, these are the politicians with business connections and vice versa. The corporate leaders with political connections. And that brings me to my next point. Uh, do we really understand what internationalizing or internationalization of higher education is? Basically, it is now about building billion dollar branch campuses overseas. It is not about learning about different civilizations, knowing diverse cultures, or intellectual intercommunication. Uh, there's no dialogue between civilizations. Internationalization has become, it's about billion dollar profits. I'll give you an example. Earlier this year, sometime around 
June, it was very much in the news. Um, China's Furan University decided to build a branch campus in Budapest in uh, Hungary. The amount spent was more than Hungary spends on all 24 of its public universities. And Hungarian taxpayers would foot the bill for that construction. Uh, of course, the protests are still going on. Uh, in fact, many, pro I think two streets within the vicinity of the construction has been renamed Dalai Lama Street and Free Hong Kong Road. So this is part of their protest, protest against the um, um, capitalism of these universities. Supposed to be completed in 2024, so let's see. Now let me, uh, I think I'm gonna um, end. Uh, I, yeah, I should end. Um, but please listen to this concluding part, uh, what, what I have to say. Um, those of us who are genuinely concerned about this crisis we are facing. I know we speak about it all the time. Uh, people are tired of hearing us talk about it. They keep saying, you know, you, you criticize so much. Where's the, you know, give us a solution. Well, I'm, I'm gonna attempt to give you some solution. Whether you like it or not, uh, just listen, and maybe you will. Those of us who are genuinely concerned must make a personal sacrifice. Um, those of us who are lecturers, Focus on your scholarship, your academic integrity, honesty, the larger philosophical question of developing a soulful, spiritual human being. Next, make an effort to move beyond this one track obsession with serving the economy. Be prepared to face cold storage, be prepared to be marginalized and isolated within the university. Be prepared for the possibility of not being promoted. This is where you need to weigh your priorities. Is academia merely a job for you? Or is it a calling? Will you still think, write, and publish regardless of all these obstacles? If you are concerned for your children's and grandchildren's education, stick to your values and spend a lifetime trying to revamp the system. I am doing it, I'm near retirement, I will continue doing it. Uh, so I can safely say I am setting the example. Lastly, always ask yourself, has your job as an educator given you hope about the future of this country? If you spend a career lifetime answering yes, that's very good. If the answer is no, there's no reason to stop educating after retirement, keep going. So the answer, my last point is damned if you do, damned if you don't, but refer back to the first uh, suggestion I made, which is stick to your principles. And uh, just before I end, uh, let me refer to what Bakri said about uh, my being at Columbia. I grew up in Singapore. I did not take a cent from the Malaysian government. Uh, my father sponsored the three of us, me and my siblings, to study abroad. Uh, as undergraduates in the United States. After that, the three of us were on our own to get scholarships in the United States to pursue our master's and PhD. Thankfully, I, I was offered the scholarship, the president's scholarship uh, at Columbia University. And that is how I uh, got my MA and PhD. So thankfully, I did not rob any money from, um, from Malaysia. Uh, I stand tall about that. All right, uh, thank you for listening. And uh, over to you, Ram, I'm sure you will uh, give us a very uh, animated um, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, 
Dr. Munira Alatas for this uh, presentation. And uh, before we uh, invite uh, Professor Rom, yeah, I would like to um, say again that this, um, I mean, before I invite Professor Rom, yeah, so I would like to give, uh, yeah, talk about his profile. So Professor Dr. Zaharom Naim is Professor of Media and Communication Studies at the University of Nottingham in Malaysia campus. His research interests are in the sociology of communications and the political economy of the media. Internationally, he is a recipient of two Fulbright scholarships as a visiting professor at the University of California, San Diego in 1998 to 1999, and as a senior scholar in residence at Johnson State College, Vermont in 2009. In 1995, he was granted a Japan Society for the promotion of science visiting scholar award and was based in Sofia University, Tokyo. Nationally, he is a current chair of the Malaysian academic movement, Girak, and was vice president of the Malaysian Social Science Association. He has published more than 150 articles in books, journals, and magazines, authored rhetoric and realities, critical reflections on Malaysian politics, culture and education, and co-edited Who Owns the Media? Global Trends and Local Resistance, and Communication and Development, The Freeran Connection. He is a country author and researcher for two ongoing major international projects, the Reuters Institute Oxford University Annual Digital News Report and the University of Gothenburg Varieties of Democracy Project. With that, I would like to invite um, Professor Zaharom Naim for his presentation. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Professor. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, IIUM, uh, IIUM's Academic Staff Association, IRF, and especially uh, Dr. Ahmad Farouk Musa, Ahmad Farouk Musa uh, for inviting me to be on this panel. Uh, it's good to finally meet Dr. Bakti Musa, I'll be uh, in an online forum. Uh, a value, uh, uh, after reading his writings on Malaysia over the years. Uh, Dr. Sharif Manira, a valued member of Gura uh, and a friend, is always good to meet and discuss matters of consequence and even matters that are not so consequential. Uh, the bad thing about speaking last in any forum is that it is likely that the other speakers have covered mostly if not all of what you want to say. Uh, the good thing about speaking last, however, is that it can give you more material to speak uh, than you had in the first place, where you can borrow the good stuff presented by the previous speakers, synthesize them, or even spin them, uh, so that they sound like pearls of wisdom coming from you. I will try to do the latter, uh, acknowledging my fellow, fellow speakers when necessary, agreeing with them when needed, and hopefully coming up with something original worth saying myself at the end of the day. Okay, looking at the rhetorical question IRF has posed as, do our universities need revamping? I begin with a general observation, uh, born out of three decades of working in Malaysian academia. It is an observation of a sad ongoing phenomenon, and it goes something like this. Much of higher education and much of research in higher education in Malaysia, and perhaps elsewhere, has become exercises in gaming a system that emphasizes rankings, uh, ratings, at the national, regional, and global levels. It is assumed by ministers, university administrators, and even the ordinary rakyat in the street who looks in awe at these Manara guarding or ivory towers, that the higher a university goes up in rankings or is rated, the more attractive and prestigious it will be that, uh, it will be that university. So facto, uh, there'll be higher student intake and a quantity for faculty, and hence for private universities, more income to succeed in a wider neoliberal system. This gaming the system, I observe, is a sad consequence and a reflection of a corrupt 
an unfair system, both nationally and globally, and it also feeds that system. There are, of course, many good, honest, and hardworking academics in contemporary Malaysian universities. Uh, some of them even socially committed and world class. But there are also those many who are pressured to meet uncompromising KPIs, often set by pen pushing regime apparatchiks, and university administrators hell bent on playing. I'm sorry, Prof. Rome. Sorry, Prof. Rome. Sorry. Could you please uh, move a bit closer to the mic? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Or that perhaps that increase the volume a little bit. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, something. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Is that better? Is that better? Or is it? It's going again. Sorry. Now I can't hear you at all. Oh God, hang on. Hang on. That, yeah. Is it possible to increase the volume? Yeah, let me try. Uh, no, that's better. Yeah, that's better. Uh, is that better now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes, please. So anyway, there are there are many uh, good, honest, and hardworking academics in contemporary Malaysian universities. Yeah, some of them even socially committed, world class. But there are also those many who are pressured to meet uncompromising KPIs, often set by pen pushing regime apparatchiks and university administrators, hell bent on playing a system that seeks to quantify scholarly output, often at the expense of quality. There are also those who are really unqualified to teach or research in our universities. They get into the public universities through a system of what some of us have described as kulitocracy, uh, a consequence of ill-conceived Ill quota system. And let's not forget, uh, the same system brings in the middle rung administrators whose idea of administration is to openly and uncritically receive and act on ideas from the top. So we combine this, first the environment made conducive for racial appointments and the accompanying cronyism, Second, a university leadership that is more politicized than wise. Third, a university administrative class that, like many Malaysian civil servants, believes that it must monitor renta or obey orders. And fourth, largely clueless yet wily academics bereft of a public service and intellectual ethos and only wishing to cari makan or get, uh, sorry, uh, or cari makan or get higher up the university hierarchy to play in departmental politics, and we find, us, I mean, and we find ourselves in the state that we are in now. Right? Indeed, as the two eminent speakers before me have rightly pointed out, universities in Malaya, Malaysia have historical sort of baggage. Uh, they're, probably, they're linked to colonial, colonial impacts and influences, market forces, and also so-called national aspirations. But they have certainly veered off in problematic directions due to personal and party motivations, that is, Amno PN, for example, uh, especially, and not due to the regime or the universities wanting to address generally, openly, and critically the many problems besetting the country and its people. I believe this veering away from coming to terms with what a university is and what role such an entity must play based on at least the three cornerstones of autonomy, academic freedom, and collegial governance has resulted in haphazard strategies being proposed and being proposed by the wrong parties or actors. So to get more into the problem, the problem in a very practical sense can be seen in the documents and policies produced over the years purportedly to transform our universities. In 2015, for example, when convicted felon Najib Razak was the Prime Minister of Malaysia, one of his documents was produced, one, one of these documents was produced under the regime's grand, now abandoned transformation program. Titled Enhancing University Board Governance and Effectiveness, the University Transformation Program, and better known as the Green Book, it is essentially 132 pages of first form without substance. Two, a glossy manual bereft of intellectual input without any discussion of the purpose of the university. Three, with no intellectual vision or direction. Four, having a top-down strategy, the transformation is assumed to be top-down. Five, proposing excessive state interference. As one critic has put it, in the scenario depicted by the Green Book, 
the VCs don't inspire, the vice chancellors don't inspire. They just have to develop skills at attracting political notice. They openly disallow academic work that might displease the politicians. They think for the politicians to secure their tenure. It is also a manual that makes no reference to what we feel is the important act, the National Council of Higher Education Act of 1996, or Act 506. As a sidebar, suddenly last month in, the, in Parliament, the NCHE, uh, the act was said to be under review. But nothing has been heard since, although the minister declared it in Parliament either as a done deal or to imply that some work was being conducted within an inner and actionless ministry. The fact is, the NCHE has been virtually abandoned, sidestepped over the past decade and a half. Now back to the Green Book. Documents like this provide the so-called drivers for higher education transformation in Malaysia. But they're essentially manuals, bereft of any philosophy of higher education, the role universities can and must play in developing individual minds, and not just preparing labor for a problematic and unequal market and society. University education, if we have to talk of transformation, must be geared towards developing such minds. It is not about to do so for it is not about to do so for now or for any period close with the inequalities. It reinforces its politicized and racialized recruitment or hiring and promotions exercises for academics. And it's similarly ethnically based bias quota system for the intake of students, principally at undergraduate level. So, what do we do? Ah, Munira had some suggestions. Uh, I have some myself. First, uh, which are quite similar to hers in, in, some, in, in some cases. First, we start with the belief that a revamp is indeed necessary. Second, we put aside self-interest, critically examine ourselves and the roles we see universities playing and what they may do instead. Three, we go to the core of the problems and seriously and critically address them. Sure, they're often structural or systemic, but structures and systems can be changed and human beings have agency. Four, we must understand that policies are not set in stone. Neither are they God-given. Uh, the idea by uh, Dr. Baki Musa just now about getting rid of the Ministry of uh, Education, it, you know, it, it's something that we have to think about. You know, why must we need a Ministry of, of Education or Higher Education? We've got two bloody ministries, sorry, two ministries, ministries there that, are, that essentially do not do very much for us at the present moment. Five, don't detract from the fact that our universities have been created within particular political, cultural, ideological, and economic circumstances. The racism out there, for example, has become very much institutionalized, made to appear acceptable, normal, even rational, but it is not. Yeah? We must start from that premise, it is not. So we, that is we academics, need to challenge these injustices and come up with a more inclusive and embracing concept of, and strategy of what affirmative action means. For example, uh, uh, for example, and enforce these new meanings based on a genuine desire to right wrongs, to sincerely correct numerous imbalances, not just racial imbalances. Yeah? The concept of justice must be coupled with the notion of merit. People talk about meritocracy, but meritocracy has to come with the concept of justice as well. Yeah? You must treat the, the, the population in a just manner, right? Politics and political interference must be fought against. They are there because we have allowed them to be there and become more prevalent in our universities. We have agency, as I said earlier. It is up to us academics to mount the challenge, even in just to regain our dig dignity. Lying down and playing dead is not an option. Only then can we ramp of uh, can, can there be any revamp of substance, of meaning? Not the revamp or transformation dreamt up by marketing executives, peddling glossy brochures, brochures, but one based on a clear understanding of what the university is or ought to be, and what a university education should entail. A revamp that is that understands how politicized our universities have become and the detrimental effects of such politicization. 
this is my stand, and this is Durat's stand in our 12-point memorandum submitted to the various parties, including the Ministry of Higher Education in early September. Herein lies the role of a conscientized academe, not the Chukokmakan groups that have grown over the decades. The majority, the, the minority, sorry, and I believe it is a growing minority, as the rot in higher education begins to look ugly and cancerous, must remember to borrow from the thinker Antonio Gramsci that the hegemony of the rotten majority is not stable or unyielding. The old indeed is dying, yeah? And looking around as the young are certainly there, just waiting to take over. And in this situation, this minority must unite. They, we must, they, we must break away from the obliging, compliant, spineless creatures that are there and, then, and that some of us have become. Granted, there may be a price to pay, but if in the end we regain our dignity, if we start exalting and celebrating excellence instead of ex excusing mediocrity, then surely I believe it's a price worth paying. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rom. Yeah, before I take uh, questions uh, from the audience, I would uh, like to invite our speakers, if uh, there is anything they would like to uh, add or comment on first. Mm -hmm. No? Okay, maybe that would come later. Yeah, in that case, uh, I'm going to take the first question. Yes, yeah, so uh, one minute. <clears throat> yeah, so we have... if. First question regarding regarding funding. Mm -hmm. Regarding funding, yep. Um, scientific research requires funding, but grants are usually limited. Isn't this where big business is needed? For example, in studying possible uses of local medicinal medicinal herbs. This question is from uh, uh, Khairuddin, retired army doctor. Yeah, perhaps uh, Dr. Bakri Musa would like to uh, answer this one regarding funding of research. Yes, that's, that's, that's the pernicious influence of big pharma in US universities and medical research. In fact, the general resentment or opposition to vaccination against COVID-19 is less an anti-science sentiment more a protest against involvement of big business, big pharma in medical research. Most medical research today are funded by them. In my own field, I have very difficult difficulty in trying to decipher papers, even though there are strict rules about declarations of interest in, in, in judging papers because they're sponsored by uh, big pharma. In the workplace I work, we have very strict rules and guidelines about sponsorship by big business, or uh, big pharma. And most universities have the same thing, but that's not the issue. But the basic funding comes from big business. And for you to get research, you have to do the research that the big companies want. The only exception to that with international organizations, um, you can bet you, if you are in Malaysia, you have no chance to get funding for doing kidney re uh, transplantation research because all the research is done in America with all the intellectual facilities we have in America. But if you do research on the immunology of amoebic infection, you are likely to get uh, funding in Malaysia. So don't try to compete with the West, but compete in your own field, fields that are neglected in the West, but are very important in Malaysia. Nobody in the West is doing much research on amoeba infection, but uh, immunology amoeba infection, but that is what needed in Malaysia. The second thing is that, again, serving the needs of the community, you'd be very surprised that when you serve the needs of the community, you could, like the Nipah virus example I mentioned earlier, you are serving the global community. Malaysia is unique in that sense uh, for field experiment on the teaching of second language. We are a unique way in, in, in the literature today, there are many theories on the, how best to teach a second language. When I was young, we had the total immersion class. We don't learn any Malay, we just stick in English. 
in California, they have the saying that, like what Malaysia is doing, that you can't teach the students unless they understand. So you teach English and Spanish at the same time. As a result, nobody learns. It. They don't learn it Spanish well, and they don't learn English well. So in California now, there is a movement towards what we learned as a child, as when I was a child, were exclusive immersion schools. That's how, that's how they teach French in Western Canada, where French is not widely spoken. So they have a certain school, all instructions are in English, just like English schools in colonial times. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, local problems, when you solve them well, have global applications. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bakri Musta. Yeah, we have a second question from the audience from Mary Magdalene Pereira. Uh, Najib. Um, ah, yes, so, Dr. Munira. Uh, before you go to the next question, uh, can I just add on to what sure, uh, Bakri just go mentioned ahead. in response to this question? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think I get a sense that the, the person who asked the question says that we cannot run away from the role of big business in uh, academia. Um, yeah, of course, you know, funding, uh, we need funding from the corporate side. Um, but the point that I, in my presentation, was I, I was trying to make is that the, uh, in the Malaysian case, the relationship between funding, uh, universities, and large corporations is a very nefarious, um, uh, um, cynical one. You know, there's always corruption and political agendas involved. So I'm not saying that it doesn't exist in other parts of the world. But my point is, we need to expose this. We need to say that it's exaggerated. And the downside of this is it has affected the quality of the graduates that are produced. So we're not saying have no, no relationship with business uh, because we need funds for research granted, but we are not addressing, as Rom mentioned, um, the fundamental problem, which is the lack of ethics, the pandering to political um, agendas, corruption, and nobody seems to care about the morality or the, the amorality that is around in our society. Um, if anyone should highlight this, it's thinkers and scholars like us. Uh, that's what we are meant to do. So we need to do it. You know, the three of us sitting here in, in this uh, webinar is not good enough. Um, you know, there are thousands of us out there teaching. You know, so over time, we need more courage and more uh, big mouths uh, within academia to, to take on this task of exposing the corruption. Uh, that's, that's what I needed to say. Thank you. Yeah, can I, uh, one, one, can I add one? Yes, yes, Dr. Bakri, yeah, yeah, please. Professor Tajudin Rusty recently wrote an article con chastising local academics, especially Islamic scholars, for not saying a thing about what's going on with the checking of menstrual flow and uh, the girls and that sort of thing. We should, the scholars should be at the vanguard of condemning this, this, this sort of act, like Sharifa said, because that's the only way to stop these guys. Otherwise, there's guys short of the scholars and the academics who are not criticizing them, then you, there's nobody to stop them. Let me show you an episode in the last day of Suharto. He was very powerful just before he resigned. Uh, he, he didn't want to resign, so he called Nakolish Majid, the famous scholar, and he said, look, I want to reform the government. I want more, more, uh, more coalitive government. And he invited Nicholas Majid to be a, a cabinet minister. But Nicholas Majid stood his ground and said, Mr. President, you need to resign. And the next day, President Sohato resigned and with no uh, associated uh, civil unrest. So the power of the voice of a of a scholar, as our prophet said, is, is still very powerful. And our scholars, our academics must not be uh, 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 afraid to voice them. Uh, if I voice my criticism, people say, ah, he's ab abroad. 
But if a scholar like Sharifa and, and Marum stays in Malaysia, then they can use the same criticism they used to criticize me. So that's why I respect people like her and also like Tajir and Razli, who are very open and very critical. And we need to hear more voices like that and our scholars. The Majlis Professor in Nagara must be more outspoken. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barakit. Uh, Professor Rome, would you like to add something? I've got this, a couple uh, of key points uh, to make that specifically uh, respond to the question asked. First, uh, the, the, the idea that uh, there is a lack of funds, I think is a bit problematic. Actually, over the years, uh, funding for research provided by the state uh, has been substantial. It's just that the funding has gone to the wrong places sometimes for you know, lots of money being spent for, for wasteful projects, uh, uh, questionable projects. And we're talking about millions, you see. So the money is there. The money certainly is there, but it's directed elsewhere. I feel in the wrong places uh, for so-called glamour sort of projects, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, so that's one. The second one is this idea of uh, study possibly used uh, to get a uh, big business to study possible, to look at the uses of local medicinal herbs. The problem with that, and this has been recorded in many other countries in the third world, is that big business comes in. They to move into the local medicinal herbs and other stuff, uh, uh, just kind of make an industry out of it. And then they essentially uh, uh, take over, right? And, and it's for, not for the local, local market then, it's about a marketing them for, 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 for a wider public, for making profit. That is the danger of that, that local, local uh, skills, local products, local herbs and spices are then no longer become the 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 the, uh, the 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 sorry sorry and no longer become a local in that sense or for the local pop, uh, population yeah so those are the two like things that I need to say yeah. okay thanks thank you Prof Rom yeah we have uh, um, another question here uh, can we, from Mary Magdalene Pereira can we consider Malaysian universities as being responsive to the market big business when there are always complaints about unemployable graduates? Seems to me that these universities, both public and private, are more concerned about pandering to the wishes of the government for public universities and shareholders and clients, that is parents, students for private universities, rather than some noble mission or education philosophy. Yeah. Uh, anyone who would like to uh, respond to this question? About Malaysian universities being res more responsive to market big business, yeah, especially regarding unemployable graduates. Mm -hmm. my, my, my school, sorry, go on. Go yes, Prof. Yeah, wrong. Yeah. No, my, my, my quick, uh, Clinical response to that <laughs> is that uh, does does higher education in Malaysia have a, a philosophy, as it were, right? Uh, this idea of a noble mission and uh, and uh, of, 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 of higher education philosophy. These kind of ideas, I, I believe, are never much considered by uh, the technocrats and the uh, the administrators up there. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and Mary is right uh, that, you know, uh, it's always about the notion of employability of graduates. It's always about uh, how the graduates can serve business, how the graduates can serve government, uh, not how the, gov the graduates uh, can question business and government. Uh, uh, so given, given that kind of attitude, and of course, mm -hmm. higher nobles, uh, some noble mission or education philosophy, those kind of uh, ideals, Seldom get lost in this need to tender to the market and to governments. Okay. I think when 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 the Sorry. Jeff go ahead, Bezos, do, do, Dr. Musinga. Yeah, when Jeff Bezos went to Princeton and Gates went to Harvard, I don't think they teach at Harvard how to 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 to, to serve big business. They teach them critical thinking, how to create wealth. 
That's the principle not to be dependent on others, what you can contribute to society. That's the values that's there. So when you respond to, to when your students are accepted by a big business, doesn't mean you're catering to big business. That means that you are providing a service, a skill through your students, that those skills are wanted by the private sector. As I said, the difference between cost and effect, the fact that your students are successful in the private sector doesn't mean you're preparing, you're serving the needs of the private sector, rather that you have trained them with skill, critical thinking skills and others that private sector needs. It's, it's again, it's the effect, not the cost. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, uh, yeah, I just want to say, add, and maybe it's a little irrelevant, but nevertheless, it'll contribute to this excessive neoliberal economic value system or ethos that has um, polluted uh, higher education. Um, you know, if we go back in history, we go back to the ninth uh, or, or 10th century uh, Cordoba in, um, in Spain, all right? Um, we all know the, the origin of the university as uh, University of Bologna, but that happened a hundred years later. In the ninth century, we have a group of scholars, not scholars as we know today who are attached to a university, but a group of thinkers, a community of um, debaters, concerned members of the community um, who were under the, um, um, the Muslim uh, golden age, the empire. These were Muslims who were concerned about society. Society was actually not um, backward. You know, it was a period of Islamic history that was progressing by leaps and bounds. So it was not an, uh, uh, an academically or a so sociologically or politically backward era of Muslim history. Yet you have the uh, development of these communities of thinkers who are reflecting on society, on humanity, um, they were translating, they were, were very concerned and aware the need to translate philosophical and uh, the works of literature, music, language, linguistics, mathematics, physics, science uh, from the Greeks. Do we see that happening today in the Muslim world? No, we don't. What we see happening is this scrambling um, to get on the bandwagon of neoliberal economic wealth and, and these excesses. So my suggestion or my, my um, struggle is to find balance in all of this. I'm not saying do away with economics. I'm saying we have gone overboard. Uh, when the pandemic hit, People around the globe were just so amazed that how rivers suddenly got cleaned up. What does that tell us? It tells us we as a human, as a humanity is slowly destroying everything around us, including our brains, um, the capacity of us to know about each other and accept each other, not just tolerate each other. We were so amazed that we, we could clean up the rivers, but we didn't really clean it up. It's COVID-19 that forced us to not use our cars, to not pollute our environment. So what does that tell us? Shall we reflect again? Just go two years back, uh, you know, two years ago. We don't need to go 500 years back. But so I, I'm not sure if this answers anyone's question, but uh, this is part of the crisis that we're having in higher education. And in fact, it, it pervades all through um, primary and secondary education. And in fact, kindergarten ed education. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Munira. Yes, uh, we have a question actually uh, uh, for you. <laughs> yes, so this question is for you, it's from Danielle. Uh, in Malaysian IPT, students are required to take compulsory courses related to ethics, politics, civilizations, and history known as Mata Pelajaran Um, regardless of their program. Recently, parliamentarian Syed Sadiq has made commentaries at MPU courses 
in IPT are burdening and caused study period for bachelor to be much longer compared to overseas. Some of the subjects are also claimed to be irrelevant with certain courses like engineering and life sciences. As an educator and scholar, how do you perceive the needs and importance of these national subjects at degree level? Are they truly necessary or is it just political? Okay, um, to answer the question, are they truly necessary? I would say yes, capital Y, capital E, capital S, bold and italic and underline. Yes, they are necessary. And I would also say that Said Sadiq, um, as young as he is and very capable, uh, I would say that his statement was rather naive. Um, this idea of speeding up the number of years uh, or, shut, or, or cutting short the number of years that undergraduates spend uh, getting a first degree um, is unnecessary. I referred to earlier in my presentation, why, why is there this need to hurry and rush through your education? And in the process, you throw away philosophy, literature. I mean, do we ask any young student or a young person, do they understand how music appreciation can actually solve our problem of, of um, our ethnic problem that we have in society? Ask an MP, do they know the relationship? I can give you, you know, a semester long course on how, why music appreciation is important to solve our ethnic uh, problems that we have in Malaysia. So this is just an example. Um, we do not, we should not suggest, you know, these uh, very, um, you know, th these, are, these are ideas that are impetuous coming from a young politician. I can understand why, but uh, I would urge people not to, uh, to think twice and maybe 10 times about this because it's very dangerous. Uh, we need the, the arts, the humanities especially, because the universities are about building or developing a human being, not an economic tool for the economy. You know, we, we've got to imbue uh, this notion of morality in our higher education, which I think we have not been doing. And of course, you know, many will, will criticize uh, this, this narrative for being too idealistic or old school, but go back 500 years compare the time then to now, you know, and you will find your answer. Yeah, Thanks, engineering sir. graduate students in America have to take humanities. Let me show you the experience of Bruce Lawrence, who is a professor of Islamic studies at Duke. He's not a Muslim, but he had a lot of engineering students from Muslim countries taking his course. He was astounded on one of his students who's Pakistan, from Pakistan, who was a Hafiz, and, uh, and that means he could memorize the entire Quran and I took the course from him. And in a conversation with Dr. Lawrence, Dr. Lawrence discovered that he doesn't understand a word of what is memorized. And that was fascinating. And by taking Lawrence's course, he knew more about the Quran than what he was doing on, on, on being Hafiz. So that's the important thing. Somebody in the comment section says that we do not teach critical thinking. And I think that's a major criticism of many Asian universities. Uh, the first liberal college that was started in Singapore, NUS and Yale, started in 1911, will close in 2024. So that, that's, that's an extra campus leadership decision that tells you the mindset of the political leadership. On the other hand, countries in the Gulf states are encouraging American universities to establish them, themselves in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in those Gulf states. Many people question this are a very expensive program and whether it is useful or not, but there is no question that those universities are attracting the most brilliant minds from the Arab world. Secondly, because the presence of those universities and the graduates they produce, they, the Gulf states are now the financial center, not just for Islamic finance, but everything else, and will eclipse Singapore soon. 
And third thing is this, of the 10 global top global airlines of the world, three are from Gulf states, Emirates, Et uh, Etihad, I think, and, uh, and one other Gulf state. So those are the results of those great universe, American universities who's done there and transmit the knowledge to the students. And those students later become the corporate world in those universities. So do not underestimate that. The crown jewel of Arab academic achievement or Arab intellectual achievements is not centuries old Al-Azhar, rather the American university in Beirut, even though the mess the country is in, AUB is still the crown jewel of the Arab world. In Cairo, Al-Azhar was established over hundreds of years ago than the American University of Cairo. But the American University of Cairo is the top choice of Egyptian students today. So that tells you a little bit about critical thinking. About, there was an American professor at one of the Gulf States universities. He was teaching critical thinking. He was a philosophy professor. And the vice chancellor told him, I want you to use this textbook. The only problem is that that textbook is an American textbook. So the examples they used were American examples. So the students end up regurgitating what American commentators have, talk, have, have written on that topic. So he di discarded that textbook and asked the student to read the local papers and discuss the local issues. After two, three years, he got enough material for his own book on critical thinking. I have a book coming up, just a plug, for critical thinking, the Quran, Hadith, and Hikayat, where I use examples and simple words, uh, simple ayat to the Quran, the simple hadith, and not to discuss the religious implication, but ex exercises in critical thinking. We must use, to exercise critical thinking, we must use examples that are, ir that are relevant to our everyday lives. Somebody in the comment made that a uh, 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 MP, a uh, PKR MP, who a graduate of LSE, making stupid remarks about Tima whiskey. Being sent to LSE or Harvard doesn't, is not a guarantee for you to make stupid, stupid statements, especially when you're a politician. But to be exposed to critical thinking, you're less likely to do, to make such silly remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bakri Musa. Yeah, um, I'll move on to the next question. Okay. So, um, history texts in our schools have become an arena of racial tension because there is one view to inculcate a single vision of a national narrative, while another pushes to provide a worldview as a means to become a world citizen and accept others who have become part of the community. What should be taught? Maybe I would like uh, Prof. Rong to answer this question. Uh, let, let me read that question again. History text has yes. become the arena of racial tension because there's one view of a single vision of the what should be taught? Certainly the second, the latter, <laughs> not a former uh, <laughs> quick, quick answer. Uh, one is just <laughs> propagandizing, essentially is putting forward a particular view, an ideological view that, that, that uh, per, uh, perpetuates a, the, the myth that uh, one, one particular ethnic group perhaps is, is is dominant, its history is dominant. And, you know, there have been so many accounts now coming out about how particular versions of history are being put across and not based on fact, yeah? Uh, based, based essentially on political expediency. Uh, so that, that that's not education as far as I'm concerned, that's indoctrination and, you know, historical, uh, historical history History of that nature is worthless in, 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 a, in a kind of intellectual sense or in a sense of liberating the mind. Yeah? So the letter where, you know, a means to become a, a world citizen, to accept others who become part of the community, of course, you know, that, that is the way we have to, we, I feel we ought to move forward. It's all this talk about multiculturalism, uh, you know, uh, Malaysia being a multicultural country and Yet, you know, there are people with their own agendas trying to pick one against the other and saying one is more superior than the other. And I think it's utterly, utterly ridiculous and that ought to be fought. Yeah? Uh, we shouldn't be quiet about it. Uh, we should challenge all of it. Uh, this links to the 
actually you missed a few questions there, and I did from the very yeah, top. Yeah, yeah, I will go back yeah, to them. I, yeah. I think we can get back to them as well. With, uh, yes, uh, yes, I will. We can get those as well, right? Okay. okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so there is a question about KPIs. Yeah, KPIs uh, is used to measure work done by personnel in the civil service to assess performance and eventually to decide is if favorable for further promotion. It is just an instrument. Otherwise, anyone can say he, she has done what is needed for a particular year. But what is the proof? So should we, what should we use instead of KPI to measure performance of uh, academics? You know, um, I, I knew these questions would come up about um, these technical questions, which I, I promised myself I, didn't, I wouldn't want to get involved in it. But I need to, to say this, um, you know, we are, we are so regimented, you know, our, our minds are so regimented about ticking boxes and, and um, filling out forms because that's the way to be promoted. Uh, we have forgotten that in order to be promoted, you've got to know your colleagues. Your colleagues have to know you. Your colleagues also have to know what you publish um, your dean has to interact with you. Your dean has to approach you and say, uh, I saw that you published such and such article or book, you know, well done. You know, let's have a chat. Um, you know, there's no, none of that is being done. So I, I, don't, I don't approve of these KPI graphs that appear, you know, at the year end all the time, how we are doing. Uh, I couldn't be bothered because uh, I do what is required uh, of any university. Uh, you know, all of us do what is required. We teach, which is a very important function. Um, you know, and our association with our relationship with the community. Are we writing outside of our academic function? Are we playing the role of, an, of, a, of a public intellectual? A few of us are. We're not getting paid for it. Uh, the university uh, pays us for our salary because we, we do the teaching and we do whatever is required, but it goes over and above our basic uh, function. And this is what I mentioned is that we need to go that extra mile. Um, there's no such thing as saying, yeah, we need to revamp it and we do the bare minimum, uh, but we don't make the extra effort. It's a lot of work. You know, it's a lot of anxiety and sleepless nights, and it's not because we are struggling and trying to pursue a higher salary. We're doing it because we care about the country and we care about this, this um, crumbling thing we call higher education in Malaysia. So as far as KPIs go, uh, if, you, if anyone out there wants to keep finding out how to meet the criteria, do so. Um, but uh, you won't find an answer from anyone who, who tends to publish something that is noteworthy, but doesn't chase an Elsevier uh, journal or a journal published by the Oxford University Press. They will go to the Cambodian Journal of International Relations, which is exactly what I did. And Bakri is laughing, but yes, why not? Cambodia is an upcoming country, it's in our region, why can't we with good minds, scholars who are pursuing a specific field of study, contribute to our fellow regional citizens? You know, I leave it there. Uh, and as I said also, the danger is you won't get promoted. The danger is you will be uh, in isolation and in cold storage. But there is a lot of positives about that too. You know, you don't need to, to speak to LSE uh, uh, graduates who have become imbeciles. Um, and I'm referring to, to whatever we have been listening to uh, recently. I was laughing, I'm sorry to laugh. Uh, in fact, I like to read Cambodian General Surgery or whatever it is, but what I'm suspicious is when they have fancy title, International Journal of this and that. Those are the ones that I'm very suspicious about. I've read quite a few articles written by local academics, and you don't have to tell me that that's a predatory journal, just from the quality of articles. You know. Okay, uh, Bakri, it goes back to, to my, these, um, uh, this misunderstanding of being interdisciplinary, 
right? The journals that come out of this warped sense or understanding of interdisciplinary is to have journal of engineering, sciences, philosophy, and um, social anthropology. Okay, now, you know, you have these very fancy titles for journals. Uh, and of course, you know, there, there are internet tools for us to, to do a, a search online as to what these journals are. But I, I, I assure you, the one I published in is not predatory. It, it just isn't in, indexed yet. Um, but what's the harm, you know? We have indexed journals that we publish in, but we also need to seek the non-indexed ones. Um, I'm reminded uh, many, many years when I was young and reckless applying for an academic position here. And the question was simply said, send me a reprint of your three most meaningful publications. That's all. And that's, to me, that's a very powerful statement. They're not interested in how many you publish. Your, what you consider should be your most significant publication and they will decide. And from three publications, they can judge you. So you don't have to go through a volume of it. Thank you. Can I, can I quickly address the question uh, and the assumptions of the question? When you, when you say that the KPI is just an instrument, uh, instruments are not created out of thin air. <laughs> instruments are created and used in particular circumstances. And we've seen, I've seen it in my university, my previous university, for example, how this idea of KPIs is used within particular context, how is even how the, the, the way the measurement itself is so, uh, is so contrived in a particular way that it can punish people despite those people actually doing the right thing. So that, for example, that certain percentage, it's quite a large percentage, which is subjective, yeah? uh, which there, there is this assess assessment of that person's quality uh, or of that person's uh, particular contribution. And it's been... A lot of these things have been misused, yeah? It's fine to say that it's an instrument, but the instrument, the way it's designed and the way it is used within a particular context, you will see that KPIs are not really faultless, yeah? They are problematic. Just looking at the technical part of it, this whole idea that they are somehow neutral instruments. They're not neutral instruments, okay? All right, okay, thanks. Thank you, Prof. Hong. Yeah, I have, um, I'll, I'll, I'll take one more question here from uh, Adriana Abu. Yeah, how can academics voice out, especially if they are earning an income from the same people who they are speaking against at times? <laughs> it is not only apathy and chasing promotions. Sometimes it is fear of rocking the boat. Not many want to sacrifice. So how do we encourage integrity over security of tenure. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, okay, this is where critical thinking, creative, the creative thought arts as subjects uh, matter in your education. Um, obviously you critique, not criticize. You're critiquing the system. You're not highlighting specific individuals and being personally condemnatory of them. At the same time, um, yes, you are paying, you are being paid by the certain university uh, uh, that, but you are, as I said, you are critiquing or, or criticizing the system, not the specific university. There are laws in place that protect you and that also prevent you from criticizing certain universities by name or certain individuals by name. So I think it is an excuse for us to say that um, such and such university uh, pays us and therefore we must accept everything. They're not Lord and God for everything. Um, if a university is going against um, student rights or lecturers rights, um, have a conversation about it. And if you cannot talk to your immediate boss, your dean, or even your uh, uh, vice chancellor, um, write about it. You know, there, there is an endless number of ways you can write about it and engage uh, a debate about it outside of the university. Uh, the internet allows you to do that. And there are ways to be polite. One has to be polite. 
Um, and one has to be factual. You know, you don't go willy nilly uh, as we do on Facebook, um, uh, condemning everything you think is uh, upsetting you. Uh, we have to do it properly and through the right channels and with facts. Nobody can touch you if you have the facts. So uh, I've heard this argument. It is, it is not, um, I do not accept the fact that, uh, you know, we're getting a salary from them. So we've got to toe the line. Uh, there are ways to navigate this uh, as many of us have. Uh, and I encourage you to do it, to keep speaking up um, and be polite about it and be factual uh, and do the right thing. Uh, don't cancel class. You know, keep supervising your students as you must. So do everything, but go on over and above it. Thank you. Thanks. I think, yes. Uh, yes. Anyone would like to add something? I think the, the, the idea that uh, what, there are a couple of ideas here that are problematic. One that they, meaning the government, pay my. Uh, if we are talking about public universities, they pay my salary. Therefore, I shall not see anything. One, the government. It, it's, 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 the money the government earns is from taxpayers anyway. So, uh, you know, public universities are run by taxpayers' money, not, not by any particular government's money, as it were. So, that's one. Two, uh, this idea that, uh, you know, uh, the idea that we, if we speak out, they will, they will clamp down on us. Once you have that idea already, you're already putting boundaries, you're putting parameters around yourself. You're essentially self censoring yourself, right? Uh, things are never ever, you know, in, in one particular state. There are, there are always ways and means of strategizing against it, yeah. Uh, and there are particular moments when there's greater space than than than, than normal. Yeah. So I think I think to say that they have all these constraints is is essentially uh, us trying to not wanting to move out of our comfort zone. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how many people have even tried. Yeah. Uh, when I, was, when I was a junior lecturer uh, many years ago in a public university, you know, when I, when I came back and I saw people were not even bothering to try. They would complain in the coffee shop, they complained in the corridors, they would complain, you know, um, in, in rooms and all that. But beyond that, they would not do anything else. So that, that, that's one problem that we have to look within ourselves. Secondly, there are academic associations in every university, as far as I know, yeah? Utilize them. Be part of them. Yeah. You know, if they're if they're not doing the things that you feel they ought to be doing, be the be the leaders of them. Become the leaders of those organizations. Yeah. Campaign for the rights of, of whatever rights you want to campaign for. Yeah. Be more upfront there. Don't be a follower. Be a leader. That's essentially it. I mean, academics should be leading in many cases. Yeah. And three, if uh, three is it four. If, for example, you are kicked out of a job, remember, you've got at least two degrees, three perhaps, even more. Yeah? You, if you've got a doctorate, unless you, 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 you essentially paid some person for your doctorate, yeah, uh, their doctorate must be worth something. And I'm sure you can get, as I, as I keep telling young, young lecturers, even if you lose your job, I'm sure you can get a better job than someone with a Form 5 certificate, yeah? So uh, don't, don't, don't think that it, it, you know, everything's impossible. Think about things that are possible, yeah? Okay? Thanks. Yeah, Thank I like you. that. Yes, like Dr. Bakri. Yeah. Last statement. I think the fear of people losing the job is very real. And in my own example is that how do you prevent yourself from being trapped? One is to create choices for you. If you create choices and you know you have choices, you, and then you're more likely not to succumb to pressure because you can always say, I can go somewhere. One of the reasons I was very brash when I came to Malaysia, because I have options. If I don't like Malaysia, I have the world stage with me. So when I went back to Malaysia, I, wasn't, I did not hesitate taking on my superiors. The reverse effect for that is this, because I was not afraid to take on my superiors, DGs, and vice chancellors, they thought I must have a very strong background. I must be related to some royalty because I was born in a royal town of Sri Manati. I must be one of the Sultan's grandchildren who rebellious get rid of Tunku's name. And I got my, my ways through that and I, 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 I exploited that. But it is correct. 
if you have choices, you are more emboldened. If you don't create choices for you, you are trapped. So for those who feel that government job is the only thing, no. Explore your expertise, explore your talent. They may be required elsewhere. And once you have choices, it emboldens you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bakri. Um, Dr. Munir Alatas, any last word before we move on to our concluding remarks? Oh, well, my, my last words are actually going to be words for the next, for the future too, because um, we will not be in finishing uh, addressing this, this issue. Uh, but I hope after listening to this um, webinar, many more will, will decide to speak up um, knowing that there are risks, but as, as Bakri has mentioned, uh, also decide on what your other choices are. Um, and, you know, everybody loves a dialogue. You know, they don't like reactionary uh, people who are trying to put them down. Uh, approach the crisis um, by dialoguing, you know, introducing a dialogue and inviting people to participate to see the bigger picture of the problem. Do this through the media, do this through social media, um, through the corridors of your universities, um, with your neighbor, um, you know, the parents of your, your children's friends in the same kindergarten. I mean, this, this is an ongoing process because uh, I, I saw in the chat that parents too um, have to be involved in this conversation about higher education because it starts from kindergarten all throughout high school. So um, that's, that's my parting words. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Munira. Thank you, Dr. Bakri Musa. And also thanks to Prof. Rom yeah, for their time for this discussion. So for our concluding remarks, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Mohammed Irwan Arifin, the president of the Academic Staff Association of the International Islamic University, Malaysia. Uh, yes, the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Arifin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Najib. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, uh, Islamic Renaissance Front, uh, for uh, inviting us, the Academic Staff Association of IAUM, to be part of this uh, uh, very, I think, interesting and um, you know, eye-opening uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the panelists, uh, Dr. Bakri Musa, Dr. Sharifa Munira, Prof. Zaharum, uh, for their uh, wonderful uh, remarks. Huh? So what I can uh, somehow try to summarize or conclude, I mean, they have given you know, all their views and opinions beautifully. Um, but one thing like what uh, Dr. Sharifa Munira you know, mentioned, this is an ongoing process. It seems that the battle is going to be forever. And it is a, it is a battleground. And uh, looking at how different peoples are giving their views and opinions, politicians and stuff, uh, we need to make sure that the right people should be able to gain the middle ground. Otherwise, uh, they will bring uh, the universities uh, not to the right direction as what we hope. Um, at uh, IIUM, for example, we have uh, done several scenarios, analysis of future studies. If things are not changing, if people are not brave enough to speak up and stuff, universities may end up either becoming a museums of the past or perhaps a factory. You know, manufacturing just producing copy and paste uh, that, that doesn't really fulfill the original objective of uh, universities. Uh, bravery seems to be a very scarce commodity, but uh, from what uh, Prof. Zaharo mentioned, uh, Dr. Bakri mentioned, the opportunities that we should be creating if we look back at the legacies of our own Islamic scholars of the past. For example, Al-Imam Malik ibn Anas, he himself, when Al-Imam al-Shafi'i, in Manaqib al-Shafi'i, uh, uh, written by Al-Bayhaqi, when he brought a letter, recommendation letter, written by the governor of Makkah, he simply threw away that letter. Do you think that there's a price to knowledge? If you want to come seek knowledge, you join with the others. You know, come to the mosque, sit with the other students and listen to my, I don't want to give any, any special kind of session. You have to respect knowledge. Huh? And if we look back at the story of Al-Imam Al-Bukhari himself during his life, you know, he was exiled. He would make isolation, like what the Dr. Sharifa Munira mentioned. If you follow the right path, you know, you perhaps you're going to be isolated. You're going to be alone. 
like what Al Imam Al Bukhari himself suffered. In the end, he died alone. He was exiled. You know, he was basically blacklisted. The government didn't allow students, you know, anyone to go and and, and uh, study from him. But if you look back at the legacy that he left behind, the future generations among us, the Alusuna wal Jamaa, you know, his legacy is considered, for example, to be the second authentic book after Al Quran. So perhaps, you know, the benefits, the fruits of all these fightings and stuff will not be seen in your lifetime. Because uh, it seems that uh, the other prominent speakers here are pretty much more seniors than me. So it seems that you are giving the right motivation to all of us, especially the younger academicians, that this is an ongoing fighting and we should not, you know, we have to be patient. Perhaps the fruits will come, you know, uh, for, for, for the futures. But we don't have to be afraid. You know, we have to have the confidence that you know, in the past, people have managed to, to, to uh, becoming the point of reference, the academician of the past. So we should somehow bring back you know, the respect uh, of, of knowledge uh, in, the, in the society. So again, uh, thank you very much to our uh, prominent speakers. This is a very enlightening speech to me personally, as well as my colleagues in, in the, you know, IUM, as well as I guess all the participants in this webinar. Thank you uh, IRF for giving us the opportunity. We look forward. Uh, for this kind of cooperation in the future. So uh, going back to you, uh, Najib, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arifin. So we have come to the end of our webinar. Yeah, so I would like to thank all of you who have joined us today and uh, continue to support uh, us uh, and show interest in the debates, uh, in, in all the debates and discussions. Yeah, for, for creating a better society. And I would like to thank again uh, all our panelists for today, um, Dr. Munira Latas, Dr. Bakri Musa, and Prof. Uh, Zahar Omnain for joining us for this session. Yeah, so with that, uh, yeah, I would like to end this session. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you.